Hello, kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria Part Art 37.2. Now, guys, this is another chapter of, Sha of the Shadow, of another part of the, the Shadow of the Ministries. This part is about Fluttershy, and I'm really curious of what's going to happen because apparently, because of Fluttershy, she de designed the Mega Spells or the Atom Bombs, which is kind of messed up. Up to find out that she was the, s the creator of the mega spell, and and she basically let at a small downhill of the end of all of Equestria, and well, not the end, but you know what I mean. Though Photoshy had good intentions, basically giving both sides a very powerful weapon, and then s hoping they both won't use it. But on the contrary. The zebras end up using them anyway. So, we're about to find out what happens. Uh, so, basically, but and also, we finally saw where Applejack saw the darkness in Steel Hooves. And that was, that was very big. We saw a big turning point, and we found out Steel Hooves was the one who murdered Zakora. He was corrupt to begin with. But maybe he's turning over a new leaf, thanks to Pip. Sorry guys, Kool-Aid's sticking to my hands. I spilled some Kool-Aid earlier. Um, and now we're going on to Fluttershy. This is going down a road that's going to mess with possibly Velvet. Everyone here has a, could probably a connection to some of these ponies. Except maybe uh, Zenith. But everyone here. I, I know that Calamity is going to have a connection with Rainbow Dash, since he is a Dashite. And then there's um, Rarity, which is basically a descendant from Velvet. She's very pretty much related to her. Um, let's see. Uh, Twilight could be a uh, dictation to uh, Little Pip, maybe. I don't know. It could be a thing. Mostly because she is a leader, like Pip is in this situation. Although, not necessarily willing to. Um, well, Pip is not willing to, like Twilight is. But there's many different dictate, di many different things. Sorry, I'm trying to, I don't know why I'm trying to use fancy words. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I gotta stop rambling. We gotta get into the story. So, let's get on to chapter 37.2. There's a secret passage from the basement of the examination building to the Royal Treasury. Steel is asked in disbelief as we gallop towards the Celestian Monument, our weapons and most of our supplies floating in tow behind me. Yep. Don't make sense to me neither. Seems to be the sort of place you wouldn't want secret ways into. Calamity responded, gliding along beside us. But that's what the map on the terminal said. I was still reeling from the knowledge of whose office I had set hoof in, whose terminal I had managed to break into. Velvet and Calamity had laid down on her bed. After her sister Luna had taken the throne, after Littlehorn, she had spent a lot more time at her school than in the castle. As we reached the monument, we slowed our pace. Most of the alicorns were on the far side of Ministry Walk, but my EFS was picking up hostiles close enough to worry about, even in the ruddy, fading light of dusk. We needed stealth right now. The Celestian Monument was magnificent, even after centuries of decay had taken bites out of its structure, leaving patches of framework bare. I stopped a moment to stare in awe, then bowed before it, sending up a prayer to the goddess. I heard the sound of static. It was growing steadily louder. A sprite bot was approaching from the front side of the monument, its speakers broadcasting white noise and necromantic death. My vision fuzzed, my head beginning to throb for what seemed the infinity of time that evening. We were just on the edge of the effect now, and we started stepping back to keep from being engulfed. I was useless against ghouls and zombies created by the pink cloud, and nearly as helpless against alicorns. But this was a threat that I alone was equipped to handle. I was the only one with a ranged weapon that was quiet. I floated out the zebra rifle, peering down its sights, tracking the approaching robot by its friendly light on my EFS compass, waiting for it to float into sight. A deadly silent trio of bullets split the night air, and the sprite bot dropped to the ground, internal circuitry burning its broadcast dying with a pop of ozone. We trotted past it, ignoring the scrap. 
Well, most of us did. Calamity picked it up and offered it to steal those, remembering the ranger's armory scrap metal to repair itself. The outside grounds of Celestia's school had been blissfully vacant. Any pony outside had fled to the safety of the buildings when the pink cloud came. Not that the buildings had proven sufficiently safe. As we rounded one of the mighty wings of the Celestian Monument, we saw that Ministry Walk had not fared so well. There were skeletons scattered all about the field, sticking out of the ground like black weeds. Ponies had filled the park when the pink cloud consumed it. A stallion whose bow tie and collar had become permanent parts of his neck. The twisted framework of a baby carriage, with the skeleton of a baby Pegasus pony welded to it, the infant's mother laying half inside the cobblestones nearby. A mare who had been sitting on a park bench in a most peculiar fashion, her skeleton now melted to the bench itself, holding her to that pose forever. Two ponies fused together in a final eternal embrace, their skulls tilted upwards in the direction the pink horror had descended upon them, snuffing out the twin flames of love and life. This is too much, Velvet Remini moaned. Then she gasped in horror, stopping dead and staring ahead of us. The Ministry of Peace. The Canterlot hub of Fluttershy's ministry had been built into a grove of magically grown trees. Two hundred years ago, it would have been a heartwarming vision of natural beauty. But the pink cloud had murdered the trees, turning them into twisted black terrors, the whole building looking like a haunted house. Small objects littered the cobblestones and lifeless planters that circled the ministry. Scissors, ashtrays, metal picture frames. All objects sucked out of the rooms whose windows had shattered. Parts of a terminal lay smashed on the steps just outside the front doors. A ceramic butterfly had shattered into six pieces scattered across a row of dead hedges. As we crept forward, Velvet Remedy hesitated. I... I don't think I want to see any more. I don't want to know what this poison place has done to Fluttershy. Velvet Remedy paused to look at a corner diorama featuring Fluttershy sitting in a forested field, surrounded by gentle animals. I could guess she was struggling against the urge to shatter the display and steal the full-sized Fluttershy for herself. You okay? I... I just can't take her away from all of her forest friends. Velvet whined softly. The Ministry of Peace had suffered severe internal damage when the trees that formed most of its outer walls had twisted into their unnatural death throes. The pink cloud had seeped into all but the most interior rooms. To our further dismay, the Canterlot hub seemed to be less a place of healing and medical research than a public front and administrative center for the other MOP hubs. We were coming up empty-hooved in our search for medicine. The only upside is that nothing in the Ministry of Peace had attacked us yet. Everything in this place was dead. I approached a set of double doors and nudged it open. Velvet Remedy, looking over my shoulder, whinnied in dismay. A haze of deep pink filled a massive room which had once been an auditorium. Rows of rotting seats descended towards a dilapidated stage beneath the last dangling threads of cloudy curtains. The walls, formed from even more trees, were blackened and dead. Velvet Remedy inexplicably pushed past me and galloped into the poisoned room. Velvet, what you doing, girl? Get yourself out of there! Velvet paid us no attention, charging up to the stage and jumping onto it. I saw her waver as she landed the pink cloud beginning to get to her. I shouted for her to come back. Beside me, Pyre Lake cried out, calling to her beloved Velvet. What in tarnation does she think she's doing? Calamity demanded. Velvet stumbled, turning and standing before the podium. She put a hoof onto it, and it broke apart at her touch. I could hear her sob. The auditorium still had great acoustics. Seeing her standing on that stage, wearing her yellow medical boxes, I suddenly realized this wasn't just any auditorium. This wasn't just any stage. Um, hello? Velvet Remedy said meekly, reciting from memory. Can I have your attention, please? If you don't mind. Oh, goddesses. Hold on, little Pip. I'm gonna go grab her. Thank you, Velvet was saying. Now, um, I know every pony is really, really busy so I'll try not to take too much of your time. Calamity, wait, I said, holding up a hoof. Pyrolite fluttered at the edge of the pink, hooting in agitation. Wait? He spun on me fiercely. She's gone plumb off a rocker. She'll die in there if we wait. I focused, wrapping Velvet Remedy in my magic. 
I'll pull her out. Just... I think maybe she needs to do this. She was risking her life to do this. And I couldn't tell if she was on the road to catharsis or catatonia. Needs to do what? Calamity demanded. Pyrelite didn't wait. The Balefire Phoenix soared into the poison, flying to Velvet Remedy. Below us, Velvet Remedy continued, her inflection perfectly matching Fluttershy's. Princess Luna has given us... That is... She's allowed us to... We have a new project. Velvet paused, looking out over the crowd that only existed in her mind, as Pyrelite landed by her forehooves and rubbed against her, nudging her to move. This is bad, Steel has told me. Velvet cringed slightly. Please, it's okay. I know we're all overworked, and every pony has so much to do already, and you're all doing just wonderfully. She gave a most beautiful smile. Oh, what in the hay? Calamity moaned. Pyrelite began to cough. I extended my magic around her, too, feeling increasingly anxious. Did she really need this? Would she ever forgive me if I pulled her out, denied her this? Did it really matter? But, this is really important. I have been talking with Princess Luna and... Velvet fell to her knees, coughing, her voice getting weaker as she struggled to breathe. I really want to do this project. I'm behind it. She coughed again. Completely. And I really hope you will be too. This horrible, terrible war has gone on far, far too long and hurt so many ponies. I could hear the sadness and hurt in Velvet's weakened voice. Sweet, merciful Celestia, I could see her tears. Enough of this, <sighs> Calamity growled. Little Pip, get her out of there now. I nodded, blinking back tears of my own. From your lips to Celestia's ears, I whimpered as I levitated Velvet and pulled my friend from the gas chamber. Velvet Remedy was barely in a condition to move, much less walk, even after I had fed her our last healing potion. We left her in the care of Pyrelite and Steel Hooves. Mind telling me what the hell all that was about? Calamity asked angry as he flew above the maze of office cubicles I was wading through. The Fluttershy Orb, I told him. I heard a crunch and felt a sharp pain in my left forehoof. Looking down, I saw that I had stepped on the skeletal remains of a small creature. I stopped, leaning against the cubicle wall and telekinetically pulled a thorn-shaped bit of broken bone from my hoof, which beaded with blood. There were other little skeletons all over this floor. That auditorium. That was the room where Fluttershy was talking to her ministry ponies in the orb's memory. Velvet Remedy was reciting it. Or reliving it. Or something. And that struck you as something we ought to let her keep doing? Calamity snapped. I... I don't know. Velvet's a performer. I don't think that was... I hope that was just her doing a performance. Her one chance to be on Fluttershy's stage. But... I turned to my Pegasus friend. The first friend I'd ever really had. Fluttershy's ministry created Mega Spells Calamity. I admitted to him. Whoa! Calamity stopped in midair, hovering. Say what now? They were originally intended as mass healing spells. She never meant for them to use as weapons of death. Calamity groaned. Ugh, Velvet. She doesn't know yet. But sooner or later she's gonna find out. And when that happens, do you think it will be any easier if we had denied her the chance to do... whatever she was doing? Ugh, fuck. Calamity bucked one of the cubicle walls, punching his hoof straight through it. We moved on. The office is quiet except for the background music of Calamity rummaging through desks and filing cabinets. The air in here was clear, if musty and old. Yet it felt like the pink cloud was all about us, eating at my friends, its corrosion seeping even into our friendships. We made our way through the floor without talking again, past the cubicles and smaller offices until we reached a curving yellow hallway. On the inner curve was a simple wooden door, the frame around it covered in little birdhouses. Along the bottom of the door were several smaller doors, as if designed for little creatures to move in and out of as they pleased. Along the outer curves were two pairs of stately, arched double doors made of polished mahogany. These two had little animal doors built into them. The far set was open, 
but all I could see of the room was just part of the wall. The curve of the hall prevented me from seeing the far end, but I didn't need to. Just beyond the open doors, there was a sign mounted on the hallway ceiling, the glass plate reading elevators, still backlit by a slightly flickering light. I checked my EFS for any signs of hostility, but the whole floor was dead. Nudging Calamity, I suggested, Let's finish this up. I want to get out of here. You take that door. I motioned towards the small, peculiar inner door. Excuse me. I'll take these. Calamity nickered unhappily, but flew ahead to the smaller door anyhow. I was wagering that an office designed to allow small animals was less likely to have dangerous defenses. Not that I was expecting anything threatening from either room. The Ministry of Peace had been entirely, even eerily, peaceful. I watched as Calamity opened the door to the inner office. It wasn't even locked. I then shifted to the closest set of mahogany double doors. Inside was a meeting room, dominated by a rich table crafted exquisitely from the same mahogany as the doors. Chairs were overturned, papers and folders were scattered. The opposite wall was dominated by a huge picture window that stared out over the pink-tainted ministry walk. The room held a single skeleton, that of a mare whose body dangled from the window, a forehoof melted to the glass. There were imperfections radiating away from her hoof, cracks in the window which had fused back together before the pressure outside could grow enough to blow the window in. A once beautiful saddle purse hung from her rotting bones, the bottom having torn away, dumping its contents all over the floor. Was that... Fluttershy? My heart sank, a knot forming in my throat. I stepped closer, eyes fixed on the skeleton, only to run into the table. Somehow, part of me was sure that it was Fluttershy. That she had... No, wait. I felt a flood of relief as I realized it wasn't the kind yellow pegasus after all. It couldn't be. No wing bones. A horn. This was a unicorn probably a secretary or a nurse, possibly a caretaker of Fluttershy's animals while she was away, but certainly not Fluttershy herself. As I walked around the table to get a closer look, I spied the far wall where a chalkboard hung between two monitors. The meeting room had been designed for multimedia presentations. Amongst the strange diagrams, the chalkboard bore four words written in bold yellow chalk, save that the first letter of each word was pink communally assured reciprocal existence. I felt weak. Oh, poor Fluttershy. I stumbled and sat in a chair. The chair promptly fell apart, dumping me onto the floor. Blinking, I found myself looking between the table's legs at the hind hooves of the dangling skeleton and the collection of rubbish that had fallen from her purse. Amongst the decayed garbage lay a statue, still pristine, of a yellow pegasus pony surrounded by birds and butterflies. She found a Fluttershy one? Rabbit. She was smiling at them sweetly from behind the curtain of her pink mane, a look of gentle caring in her eyes. I got up, walking closer until I could see... Be Pleasant. The final of the Ministry Mare statuettes. I now had a full set. Only, I wasn't going to keep this one. I knew a unicorn who needed her more than I did. Besides, wouldn't it be wrong for corrupted kindness to be carrying around a statuette of the bearer of the element of kindness? Wouldn't I be dishonoring her somehow? So it was with every intention of giving the Fluttershy statuette to Velvet Remedy that I wrapped it in my magic. And everything changed. I felt a surge of magic, much like with the others. But this time, it was accompanied by something more. Something greater. As I lifted the Fluttershy statuette before me, I knew that I was going to keep her. Not out of selfishness, not because it was something I wanted or felt I deserved. The statuettes wanted to be together. The Ministry Mares needed to be together. They were meant to be. Fluttershy, Rainbow Dash, Pinkie Pie, Twilight Sparkle, Rarity, Applejack. They were stronger when they were together, better. Separating them had been the worst thing any pony could have done to them. I knew that, and now that I had brought them together, I knew I couldn't separate them again. Calamity dumped out the medical supplies he had found. I found Fluttershy's purse in the office, he told Velvet Remedy. And no, before you ask, she wasn't there. 
but she left us all with this. Velvet Remedy's smile touched her eyes, making them sparkle. It was as if Fluttershy herself had left the supplies we would need, just for us. Cabinets weren't even locked, Calamity commented. Velvet began sorting through the medicine. Calamity had simply grabbed everything. I recognized super restoration potions and healing potions. Enough to get us through three cantalots, with some to spare. Painkillers, too. Most of the rest, however, were beyond my ken. Veterinary medicine, Velvet Remedy explained, dividing the pills for animals from the drugs for ponies. Then she took a few from the former pile. For pyrolite, just in case. Pyrolite gave an exaggerated hacking sound and then shot Velvet a challenging look. Oh, you'll take your medicine if I give it to you. Velvet shot back, eyes narrowing but smiling nonetheless. I already have enough problem patients with these ponies. Fluttershy's office was more like an office for a doctor than the head of a whole branch of equestrian government, Calamity mused. There was even an eye child on the wall, but with nuts. He placed a hoof over one of his eyes, mimicking. Acorn, almond, walnut, cashew, peanut, another acorn. Velvet Remedy wrapped the healing potions in her magic and divided them amongst us. Keep these with you. In a place like this, it makes no sense for only one pony to be carrying all the medical supplies. She then scooped up the rest in her medical boxes, save for a selection that she set aside for steel hooves. Turning to the outcast ranger, Velvet cautioned. Now, I'm giving you what I can, including about half the painkillers. But Fluttershy didn't stock up on combat drugs, so I'm afraid you'll have to do without Buck and Dash and whatever else you've been pumping into your body. She tisked. And we still need to find you a radiation pit as soon as we can, before you go tussling with anything too nasty. Steelhoves nickered but said nothing, letting Velvet Remedy access the medical dispensary in his armor. Calamity pulled out a few cans and boxes of food he had scavenged from a wall-mounted vendor. I felt a rumble in my gut and realized I was starving. Two hundred-year-old snack cakes didn't sound too appetizing, but what Calamity put before us was all we had. We left all of our provisions with Zenith and the starving zebras of Glyphmark. Y'all will be thrilled to know that Fluttershy and her ministry were apparently all vegetarians, too, Calamity quipped. Velvet Remedy shot him a look. Calamity, I can't believe that even after Arbor you would still even think of eating meat. She pointed a hoof at me. Even little Pip has learned better. Oh, gee, thanks, I muttered. Calamity shrugged. Yes, yeah, spoken like some pony ain't never tasted bacon. Damn. I had to admit, I was gonna miss bacon. But after unwittingly eating another pony, I didn't think I could stomach it. Velvet neighed, eyes narrowing as she stepped towards the Pegasus, bringing them almost muzzle to muzzle. You know, sometimes I think the reason you didn't have as much trouble with those cannibals as we did is because you like meat, and you don't see eating ponies as very far from eating a rad hog. Calamity whinnied back, eyes narrowing in return. And sometimes I think the reason you stable folk get all uppity about eating meat is because you can't see it as being more than a step away from eating ponies. Huh, <sighs> so much for eating. I watched helplessly as the two lovers glared at each other. Ponies are supposed to be vegetarians. Eating meat is a perversion. Every time you do it, you let the wasteland win a little. Nonsense, it's survival, Calamity countered. Hell, even eating ponies is a victimless crime. After all, they're dead. They don't care. It's only when pony folks start killing other ponies, like the bastards in Arbu did, that I reckon they've done anything wrong. More glowering. The air between them was so tense I was waiting for something to explode, giving equal odds to them shooting each other or kissing. Finally, Velvet Remy suggested in a low voice, Let's say we back away and just go to the next building before one of us says something he will regret. I reckon y'all say something you'll regret first. On the contrary. Oh, oh my god, they're really uh, doing this? Are they really making this reference? Are they literally making this reference right here? Oh my god. I caught that real fast. I knew it. I shouted, unable to take the tension. I magically scooped up the uneaten food and dumped it into my saddlebags. Seriously, both of you, 
I stopped. Come on, we're moving to the next building. Calamity, you're in front with me. Velvet, you're in back. I grumped, floating up all of our weapons and supplies. Goddesses, I can't take you two anywhere, can I? Pyrolite landed on Steel's battle saddle. I swear, that bird was laughing. We were halfway between the Ministry of Peace and the Ministry of Arcane Sciences when the Alicorn spotted us. She was standing on the roof of Twilight's ministry, staring down into the walk below. At first, I had mistaken her for a carved statue. The whole ministry building had a vaguely Alicorn motif. The knight on the ministry walk chessboard. The dark blue stone was probably meant to honor Luna. The wall that encompassed the base of the building was of smooth marble with silver inlays and embedded diamonds in the form of constellations. The sort of display that you would expect from a tastelessly ostentious observatory or a really bad dress. Even with the red light on my EFS, I was legitimately surprised when what I thought was part of the architecture launched itself into the air and swooped down towards us, her magical shield flickering to life around her. Kropow. I collapsed, clutching my ringing ears as the shot from Spitfire's thunder pierced the alicorn's shield and tore through her neck, splattering her blood against the inside of her shield behind her. The shield flickered out as the alicorn plowed into the ground at our hooves. Velvet Remini moved to me, dipping her head to nip my barding, helping me back to my hooves. As soon as I was standing, she backed away, saying something, but I couldn't hear her over the ringing in my ears. Comprehending my blank expression, she pointed a hoof up at the field of Ministry Walk. I twisted, and my EFS compass filled with red lights. <coughs> the shot had brought a lot of attention. Alicorns were beginning to look this way, a few of them already taking flight. Silos galloped past us, ignoring the Ministry buildings completely, firing missiles and rapid-fire grenades at the clusters of alicorns. The field of Ministry Walk erupted in dirt, smoke, and flame. Kropow! Kropow! Calamity fired Spitfire's thunder as quickly as the massive weapon would allow, taking aim at the shielded alicorns while Steelhoves dashed through the thick pink pool, tearing apart those too slow to react with his patented level of massive overkill. One of the alicorns on the far side of the pink water reared up. I'll bring the head of the Pegasus to Knights here myself! She launched into the air, her shield sparkling to life around her. You what now? Calamity asked indignantly, his muzzle still biting down on Spitfire's thunder. Kropow! The shot passed through the heart of the flash of light where the alicorn had been in eye blink before. In the same instant, the dark purple monster appeared in another flash, right behind Calamity. I charged, Velvet Remedy galloping beside me as I fired little Macintosh, the bullets <coughs> sparking as they ricocheted off the alicorn's shield. The alicorn's horn glowed. I slid to a stop, gasping as I watched blood from the crashed alicorn corpse beside Calamity float up, wrapped in the purple alicorn's magic, and begin to shake shape. Calamity spun around, but the alicorn was too close. The barrel of Spitfire's thunder struck the shield, knocking out of Calamity's teeth. Velvet Remedy skidded to a stop, pressing her glowing horn against the alicorn's shield as she cast her anesthetic spell, the ball of light manifesting just inside the shield and striking the alicorn. The alicorn collapsed inside of her shield, her body paralyzed, but her magic still unhindered. The blood from the dead alicorn next to us solidified into a ruddy blade. The blood sword flew at Calamity. He reared back, the blade slicing past him, leaving a shallow cut below his neck that wept blood. I could hear the whoosh of Steelhoof's rockets, and the continuous thunder of his grenade machine gun. <coughs> From the sound, he had switched to high explosive grenades in an effort to beat down the alicorn's shields. The blood sword circled around, diving for Calamity's face. My Pegasus friend clamped down on the bit of his battle saddle, firing. The sword burst as he shot it out of the air. Y'all run on ahead, Calamity shouted. I've got this one. He kicked up Spitfire's thunder and snatched the muzzle bit in his mouth. Well, this is completely badass. The paralyzed alicorn looked up at him from inside of her shield, eyes widening. Kropow. Velvet Remini urged me towards the Ministry of Arcane Sciences, then began galloping towards it herself. I quickly followed, Calamity covering our backs and Steelhoofs. Well, Steelhoofs seemed to have forgotten the rest of us completely. He was just being the mighty Alicor Hunter, steel-armored scourge of monsters in the equestrian wasteland. 
Calamity spun as two more shielded alicorns dove out of the darkening pink sky. Legion Spitfire's thunder, taking aim. Click. Aw, oh, crap. Calamity's eyes widened. Deciding there was no time to reload, the Pegasus turned tail, flying after us. The two alicorns swooped over the pool, their shields skimming the pink water. They swerved broadly around Seahos, giving him a wide berth. Steelhoofs tried to turn towards them, but he was far enough into the Ministry Walk's reflective pool that the watery pink sludge was impeding his movement. The alicorns left him behind, chasing after Calamity. I heard multiple cracks of thunder and the air lit up in bright flashes as several alicorns fired bolts of lightning into the reflective pool. Steelhoofs let out a deep-throated scream as arcs of electricity lashed over his armor, then collapsed into the water, vanishing beneath it. Damn it! I changed God damn, why steel hooves? Running towards the water, dodging I tried to make He was the biggest badass of the wall. I searched for steel hooves with my EFS, but there was no light. Either he was dead again, or the super saturated pink water was impairing my pit buck's targeting spell. A wing of alicorns took flight, soaring over the violently sundered corpses of several of their sisters. A fourth cast another lightning bolt, the flash momentarily blinding me. I could feel heat and smell ozone as the bolt ripped through the air less than a yard from my body. I reached the edge of the pool and jumped, wrapping myself in magic and telekinetically flying over the pool, swerving as much as I could while keeping my head down, looking for any trace of our fallen metal paladin. If I could just spot him, I could wrap him in a levitation field and... My head exploded, my horn feeling like it had cracked apart. Even as I screamed, I knew there was a broadcaster hidden in the water. I dropped, all four hooves splashing down into the thick pink sludge before I caught myself. My head was splitting from the effort. My horn felt like it was trying to screw itself into my head. I was certain that the necromantic energies were somehow focusing on the source of my magic. I had to find the broadcaster and get rid of it. No, I had to get up. I had to get away. I noticed somehow, awareness, that the alicorns were holding back. This was the same spot the others had veered around before. I had thought they were avoiding steel hoofs, but even as I screamed in agony, I realized, be smart, that they had been avoiding the broadcaster. I could feel a new agony, a terrible burning in my hooves and legs. My magic imploded, and I dropped into the viscous pink pool with a splash. Now my whole body was burning. I clamped my muzzle shut, thrashing involuntarily from the pain. If I drank it, even a little, I was surely dead. I forced myself to focus past all the pain. I no longer wanted to get myself away from the pink pool or the broadcaster. I could no longer comprehend moving. Now, in utter desperation, I tried to get them away from me. With all the concentration I could manage, I wrapped the entire pool in my magic and floated the water, the skeletons, everything that wasn't me, up as high and as fast as I could. The super-saturated pink water of the reflective pool flew into the air. I looked up, gasping as the pain in my horn and head receded. The burning faded, lingering most heavily around my right foreleg. I stood, shaking violently, flinging the pink water off of my body until I almost felt dry. Then I finally dared to open my eyes. The alicorns had flown back, away from me in the suddenly flying pool of water overhead. They stared and murmured to each other in voices I could describe best as concerned. I looked up. In the last rays of twilight, I could see hundreds of small coins and bottle caps glistening along the bottom of the water. I could see skeletons floating in it, many of them fused together. I finally spotted Steelhoofs, his metal shod tail dangling out, out of the pink liquid. I gingerly separated him from the mass of liquid above me. I looked the way I had come. Calamity, Velvet Remedy, and Pyrolite were all staring with expressions trapped between screaming and cheering. I tried to gallop towards them, taking Steelhoves with me, but searing agony shot up my right foreleg, and I fell onto my face. My body had been through too much. It didn't want to cooperate anymore. But even through the dull pounding in my head, I was able to focus enough to wrap myself in magic. The pain in my head spiked, the throbbing jumping in order of magnitude but I slowly pushed myself back towards the edge of the pool and my friends, Steelhoves in tow, releasing more and more of the cloud-saturated water as I went. The liquid pink poured down like a curtain behind me. 
I felt myself begin to pass out. The effort of self-levitation was far too taxing, and my body was screaming from abuse. Suddenly, I felt warm forelegs wrap around me. Calamity had flown out underneath the floating lake of pink and was taking me to safety. He soared over the edge of the pool just as my spell collapsed completely. I heard Steelhoofs drop onto the field with a metallic thump. Velvet turned and galloped towards him, her horn glowing. Calamity didn't stop, flying towards the entrance of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. Hold on, little Pip, he encouraged as he flew through the front doors and was gone. I felt a moment of freefall. I think I even felt myself hit the floor. Then, blackness. The yellow carpeted floor raced under my feet. I could feel my nerves on edge. I found myself trapped in a small, utterly alien body as it darted between the hooves of scrambling, panicking ponies. A constant rumbling thunder filled the air, mingling with cries and shouts from the ponies I was scampering through as I raced down the aisles between a city of cubicles. A magenta pony spilled a shower of papers in front of me as she fled the room. One of the sheets slapped me in the face as I barreled through them. I made it through the offices and found myself charging down a huge curving hallway, my little heart pounding in my chest. I heard a mare screaming from beyond a set of mahogany double doors. The voice was filled with rage and tears. How could they? How could they do this? I dashed for the little door built into the bottom of the larger one. A little door just my size. This must be Fluttershy's memory. They, they've ruined everything. They've... They've killed... They've killed everyone. The meeting room looked like it had been hit by a tornado. And it really had. A yellow and pink tornado in the form of Fluttershy. I burst into the room just in time to see her hurl a terminal through the glass of the seemingly gigantic picture window, shattering a large hole in it. The sound of impossible thunder amplified. Outside the window, I could see the sky shimmering and rippling with explosions as zebra missiles pounded against the princess's shield. Each impact brought a flash of fiery light splashing against the shield, the surface rippling outward like water around a dropped rock. Fluttershy stood on this table, shaking, stomping, her face streamed with tears and contorted in rage. She looked around for something else to throw, something else to break. I... I gave them life. And... and they... and they... I knew this room. I had just been here. The window had already begun to repair itself, the shattered hole growing smaller as the spider web of cracks thinned and shrunk. Ministry magic. The building was alive. It healed. I leapt up onto a chair and from there onto a table, rushing to Fluttershy's side. They... I... The poor Pegasus sobbed horribly, trembling on the verge of collapse. I did this. It's all my fault. I reached Fluttershy, wrapping myself around a forehoof, hugging her tight and trying to comfort her. <laughs> oh... She looked down at me, and I felt her tears splash onto my forehead. Oh, no, no. Angel, what have I done? Every pony, all the helpless little critters, they're all going to die, and it's all my fault. Fluttershy toppled onto the table, burying her face and wailing. Beyond her, I saw that fateful writing, communally assured reciprocal existence. I held Fluttershy, stroking her anxiously, trying to help and feeling terrible in general. She didn't deserve this. This wasn't her fault. Outside, the pounding thunder and violent light show continued unhindered. With a bang, the second set of mahogany doors at the front of the meeting room slammed open and a white unicorn burst into the room. Her gorgeous purple mane and tail looked frazzled, and of course. a saddle purse hung next to the three diamonds of her cutie mark. Fluttershy, Rarity called out, looking around and spotting the crumpled, weeping Pegasus. Oh, oh goodness. Rarity trotted up hurriedly. Fluttershy, darling, we have to go. She prodded the sobbing, broken Pegasus. We only have half an hour before they're supposed to seal up Stable One. We need to get inside. Stable One? I couldn't tell her that it was already probably too late. We... just... just... Just leave me behind. 
Fluttershy whimpered. You go, Rarity. Save yourself. I... I deserve to die. Rubbish. Rarity put her forehoofs under Fluttershy's head, lifting her tear-streaked face. You deserve to live. Probably more than the rest of us. I won't let you die here. Rarity? A tear dripped down one of Rarity's cheeks. I love you, Fluttershy, and I'm not going to let you stay. Rarity smiled softly, but her voice brooked no argument. Now you pull yourself up and come with me, or I'll drag you all the way with my teeth. I looked between Fluttershy and Rarity, one paw still petting the yellow pegasus gently. <laughs> Foomp. All three of us turned to the window. It had almost repaired itself, the new hole the size of a baseball. Outside, the shield continued to fluctuate under the massive fiery barrage. Then we saw it. A thick pink mist rolling over the city. Oh no. It consumed block after block, flooding down the alleys and boiling over the tops of buildings. Rarity let out a gasp as the thick pink mist splashed against the towering Ministry of Image, breaking around it as the same wave of pink rolled over the Ministry of Arcane Technology, drowning it completely. I blinked, and the Ministries on the opposite end of Ministry Walk were gone. Then the trees were gone. The pink cloud washed over the grassy park, the reflecting pool, and all the terrified, panicking ponies below. The wall of pink rushed at us. The park was gone. Rarity gasped again, this time spotting the hole in the window. She threw herself towards it. The trees were gone. Rarity slammed a forehoof over the hole. The wall of pink hit the Ministry of Peace. There was nothing outside the window anymore. The cracks that remained in the window began to warp and melt, fusing together. Rarity groaned in pain, but she held her hoof firm against the hole. Not that means that's Rarity eyes. in the window! Rarity? Rarity's eyes opened wide. She gazed at the window, whispering with a low tone of comprehension. Yes, this is necromantic. Rarity turned to Fluttershy, who was staring at the window in horror. Forget stable one, Fluttershy. I'm getting you to safety. With that, she focused, and her horn glowed. A flash of light burst around Fluttershy, and the yellow pegasus was gone. I felt the worry and anger etch across my face. I scampered up to Rarity and kicked at her. She looked down at me, her horn glowing again as she opened her saddle purse. Don't worry, Angel. I've sent her someplace safe. I kicked at her impatiently. Ow. Okay, I sent her to Zakora's hut in the Everfree Forest. Well, at least I got her very close to it. The zebras are attacking pony population centers. There are no ponies in that forest. So it's the only place I'm sure they will not attack. So Fluttershy would have been alive the whole time. Memory orb. Don't worry, Angel. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Zakora's hut was in the Everfree Forest. Everfree Forest was the only place where there was no oh, mega spells being hut struck. That means Fluttershy survived the whole thing. If she's at Zakora's hut, there could be two things possibility. She could have rode all, flown all the way to Ponyville to see, to try to atone for her thing. What? And atone for the things that she thinks she's done. Or she could have stayed. Try to, try to take care of the Everfree Forest. But first, I need to leave a message for Twilight. Rarity stared down at me. Twilight, darling, I've sent Fluttershy away. And if I can, I'll be going too. I don't want you teleporting around town looking for... Mm. Oh, this is bad. Rarity faltered. I could see even this small contact with the pink cloud was beginning to kill her. Don't look for us. Don't stay in Cantalot. But... But there is... Ooh. Rarity thudded against the window weakly. Her hoof would have dropped away, but it couldn't anymore. It had become part of the glass. Listen, Twilight. In my desk, in my office, there is a very special book. 
It's an... <clears throat> it's hidden in a secret compartment. You may have to tear the desk apart to get at it, but... <clears throat> but don't worry. I won't mind. Twilight is a spellbook, and... Rarity began to cough violently. And I believe it has a spell that can be used to... to defeat this necromancy. You... you must get that book. Rarity leaned against the glass, her hoof supporting her weight now. Still, she floated the memory orb close to me. I realized suddenly why she'd been talking to me like I was Twilight Sparkle. My memory was going to be the message. Her horn glowed. Don't worry, Angel. This won't hurt. As soon as I'm done, I'll send you to Flutter... Well, I guess we got a first-hand experience of what the cloud looked like. Oh, what it, what it seemed like. We can't really see the cloud, but you get my point. Huh. Who knew? So Fluttershy did survive the bombs. That's that. That's a big step. That means she. We. So there's still more question though. What did she do when she arrived? What happened after that? That's what I want to know. What happened to Fluttershy? So we know how Twilight died. We know how. So far, we still don't know how Rainbow Dash died. Um. Let's see. We know how. Oh, Rarity died now. Let's see. We know how. Let's see. Applejack. How did we? Okay. I don't remember... Okay, we know what happened to Applejack. She died of old age in the stable. Um, let's see, let's see. Who am I missing? Uh, Pinkie Pie. We know she died into the bombs. She, she, the, her skeleton still hi sitting in the... Sitting in the... Um, one of the... Um, mi uh, ministry of Image... Uh, sorry, not Image. Um, ministry of... Um, I can't remember. Fuck. Uh, it was... Uh, Give me a sec, I, I got this. It was a. Uh, um. Something. No. Oh, whatever it is. In her ministry, which was, uh. In her ministry. And she was still oh, eating her mentals until she died. And. Let's see. And who else? Rarity, Fluttershy. Fluttershy, Rarity, Twilight, Rainbow Dash, Applejack, Pinkie Pie. So, and Fluttershy is still a mystery. Same with uh, Rainbow Dash. So, we know what happened to three... We know one, two... Fluttershy, Rainbow Dash, Applejack, Rarity, Twilight, Pinkie Okay, we don't have it. We already know. Sorry if I'm... Mumbling. It's, uh, we know how it happened to four of the ponies. We know where there are fates, but we still don't know the total fates of both Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash, because that, that, that's a big that's a big what if there. What what what's going on here? Though the the think about it, the last two remaining in ponies we still haven't discovered are Pegasus or Pegasi, so that that could mean something there. Well, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this awesome chapter of Fallout Equestria, and I hope you guys enjoyed it, too. Uh, I just realized I repeated myself. Well, anyway, guys, I'll catch you guys later, and stay nerdy, my friends. Bye! Oh, hold on, guys. Okay, now bye. Sorry, technical difficulties.